what if some or maybe many of the things that you know about what it takes to be healthy or maybe become not unhealthy are upside down and backwards? Well, we're going to be taking a look at some of those today on this episode of the Movement Movement, the podcast for people who want to know the truth about what it takes to have a happy, healthy, strong body, starting feet first, because you know those things are your foundation. And we bring up uh, the propaganda, the lies, the mythology that you've been told about what it takes to run or walk or hike or do yoga or CrossFit or play, whatever it is you like to do, and to do that enjoyably and effectively and efficiently. Did I say enjoyably? Trick question. Of course I did. Because look, if you're not having fun, you're not going to keep doing it. So, you know, that's going to be fun is going to be part of the equation. I'm Stephen Sashin, CEO of ZeroShoes.com, your host of the podcast. And we call it the movement movement because we're creating a movement that involves you. I'll tell you how in a sec about natural movement, letting your body do what it's made to do. And um, the simple thing about helping us with the movement part is go to our website, www.jointhemovementmovement.com. Nothing you need to do to join. There's no cost. There's no secret handshake. There's no song you have to sing. And um, that's just where we, that's just the domain I got. And that's where you'll find previous episodes, all the ways you can find us on social media, all the places you can find us wherever you get your favorite podcast, basically. Um, but more importantly, if you want to help and spread the word, be part of the movement, then give us a thumbs up or a like or a review, um, hit whatever it is you know how to do. Just basically, if you want to be part of the tribe, please subscribe. And before we jump in, because for anyone watching, uh, you're going to be already wondering, I've got a sling on for my left arm because yes, I was setting the world deadlifting record and got injured. No, that's not true. Uh, old gymnastics injury finally took a toll on me and I'm in a sling for the next four weeks. No big deal. But um, And luckily it's my left hand, which I got to tell you, even though that's my non-dominant hand, I use it for a lot of things. And habitually, like once or twice a day, I try and do something and go, oh, geez, because I'm not supposed to do that. So anyway, let's have some fun. Kevin, I didn't tell you, I'm not going to do an intro for you. Why don't you tell people who the hell you are and what you do? Oh, well, thank you very much. I will happily take the floor on that. And you kind of just answered my question about your shoulder. I saw the sling and um, I have a friend who just walked in the gym with a sling on, similar to yours, almost identical. And she's four weeks out from taking it off. And I know how much of a bugger that rotator cuff injury is because I've had a lot of friends and family members and clients that have had it over the years. So well, hold that thought though. This one's not even rotator cuff. The right one was rotator cuff and bicep. This one was all bicep tendon. It got shredded. And Ooh. so what they did, th this is amazing. Actually, they basically took essentially a drywall screw and screwed it into the top of my arm bone, my humerus, and then attached the tendon that was still healthy at that spot to that little drywall screw, and then cut off the rest of it from there to where it attaches to your shoulder. Cause I don't need it anymore. Cause it wasn't working anyway. And so um, now I'm, I'm, I'm not, bionic, unfortunately, but I'm, uh, I'm a Home Depot project. <laughs> what a good reference that was. So uh, aftermarket parts, you still have them. And I know a lot about drywall screws because I come from a family of carpenters and my dad worked in the carpenters union for many, many years when I was a young kid, which kind of defined, <laughs> kind of defined me as an adult with my level of fitness and exercise that I'm passionate about. But anyway, to rewind a little bit, give you a little bit of story of my background. I've been in the health and fitness industry for about 25 years. Um, I've been exercising and working out to some capacity since I was about five years old, and I'm a fitness nutrition specialist. I have a, a bachelor's degree in sport, uh, sports medicine, fitness, and wellness from California University of Pennsylvania. I'm certified through ACE, ACSM, NASM, AFM, which is a movement specialist certification. Um, I also specialize in fasting, minimalism, barefoot <laughs> running, barefoot education, and I love to run barefoot and I like to connect to the earth with barefoot as well, whether it's grass or whether it's um, concrete or any kind of aggregate surface other than blacktop, because there's an agent in blacktop that stops the earthing from getting the negative ion, stops by from getting the negative ions from the earth. And I know uh, we're well, that uh, uh, well, now. <laughs> well, first of all, look, as a guy, as you and I share something. We have a lot of uh, info about a lot of things in a bunch mm -hmm. of different topics, some of them under an umbrella, in this case, sports and fitness. But I think you're going to have to stop uh, using the word specialized. Okay. Well, well, because it's one of the, I mean, I look, I totally get it. It's just kind of funny. It's like I specialize in and when you list five, seven or things, uh, it's like, eh, um, and I totally get it. I don't sleep much. And Dan and I, I specialize in myself when I say that too. It's not necessarily an ego thing. Like, oh yeah, I'm the, I'm the oh, best. No, 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 no. I'm, yeah. just, I'm just teasing about that. It's just like, it's, um, I'm, let's say I'm a specialist in generalism. <laughs> True. I get it. Yeah, there you go. I there you go. That. And by so the way, for the, and for those of you who are not watching the video version of this, um, Kevin talked about all these things that he's, you know, a, a, an expert in when it comes to fitness and what he's been doing. And you wouldn't know it from looking at him. I mean, holy smokes. So that was, by the way, completely sarcastic. <laughs> so 
Um, so, so out of all these myriad things, what's the one that's getting the most attention for you right now, either for you or for people that you work with? Complex movement patterns and crossing the midline of the body and trying to reverse the aging process of the brain, which is zero people pay attention to it. And that is one of the things I'm trying to bring to the forefront. Um, another thing I utilize are classical training tools like Indian clubs, goddess, maces, and these tools called wands, help wands. And what I do is I take exercise to a different, a whole different dimension, like a fourth dimension, if you will. So you've got bench presses. Great. They build your chest. They build your shoulders, your arms a little bit. And you got deadlifts and you got lat pull downs and you got lunges and you got heavy squats and all these different things that people love to do. And, and that is still, that still forms the basis of most workouts. But I promise you, once you cross 40 years old, definitely, but even 30 years old, you have to ask yourself, how is this going to benefit me in real life and outside the gym? And if you're a uh, you live in Colorado. I live in Utah. We live in like, I would call them resort towns, sort of. Um, I definitely do. And everyone here is an athlete. Everyone likes to do things outside the gym. They like to hike. They like to bike. They do slacklining, canoeing, climbing, you name it, in the outdoors all year round. So when someone comes to me and says, I want you to train me, I'm mean, watching you in the gym. I say, the first question I ask is, first, do you have any injuries? Second, are you on any medications? And then what do you like to do outside the gym? And as soon as I ask that question, boom, eyes go up like this. Oh, you know what? I, I, do, I do 5Ks and I like to run and I like to do this and that and blah, blah, blah. And I play pickleball and I play tennis with my wife. I'm like, great. So I immediately say to myself, how can I make you better at all that stuff you love to do out there? Because it's going to make your experience better and it's going to be more fun to you. And that is going to make me more successful in helping you. So one of the ways to do that is by doing cross-body patterns and, tr and training the core and the body in a way that, that pertains to more than just like decline sit-ups and like crunches and plank holds. So there's an all-encompassing factor I like to incorporate in every one of my training sessions, regardless if you're five years old or 25 or 55 or even 80 years old, especially people that are aging, they've got to work on their balance and their flexibility and their brain function. And the best way to do that is by crossing the midline of the body. It lights up the brain like a Christmas tree, neuroplasticity, it's neurological load. So give people some examples of what we're talking about then. Okay. So if you stand up and you simply just go like this and slap your opposite hand with your opposite knee from a standing position. If you're a, a desk job. Well, hold on. Again, for people who aren't watching, let me clarify. Oh, that, doesn't okay. mean bending, that doesn't mean bending over to slap your knees with your hands, what Kevin did. And you're sitting while you do this. But same idea when you're standing is like, for example, lift your left knee while you're tapping it with your right hand. Did I get that correct, right? Correct. Correct. And, then, so, and then, then, flips, then flip sides. Yes. And there's a bunch of patterns you can do just by that. So you can stand up and you can lift your knee, tap, tap your opposite knee. Then you can lift your foot and tap your opposite foot. And then you can reach behind your body and tap your foot from behind and repeat that cycle five mm -hmm. times in a row. And your brain will just go pow. It'll light up like a Christmas tree. And you're like, wow. And that's a good way for someone who is wearing a suit, working a 16 hour job to get up in the middle of the afternoon and do that movement break. And it's going to rekindle their brain cells just like that. It's going to help them have more work output and their boss is going to be happy with them. And that's a small example. And then when you're in the gym, oh, go ahead. Well, I was going to say um, what you're actually highlighting, you know, when I think about all the things that we used to do that we're no longer doing that were useful then that we're not that we've kind of forgotten what you just said is we all should be doing the hokey pokey. Yeah. <laughs> the hokey we, pokey and twister are two yeah. of the best things you could possibly do. <laughs> Dancing. <laughs> yeah. Put your left foot in. Put your left. I mean, yeah. I mean on, honestly, it's really funny. There are a lot of those those really, really fun dances that people just aren't doing anymore are mm -hmm. all cross body movements. Exactly. And the more complex the movement is, and the more body you engage, the, the higher endorphin release you're going to get, and the more brain retention you're going to have. So your mood is going to improve, your anxiety is going to go down, your depression is going to go down, your ability to think and concentrate and your memorization skills are going to go through the roof, especially if you do workouts that are like all incorporating these movement patterns. And that's kind of how I've, I have crafted my style over the years. And I've gotten to that point where it's almost all crossbody patterns and unique exercises. It's not just like dumb, dumbbell clean and presses. It's like a single leg, one arm clean and press where you're on your right foot and you're holding the dumbbell and you cross it over to the left side of your body while keeping your left leg off the ground and doing a press above your head. And then you do a series here and a series here. And then you go into a plank and you do a contralateral limb raise, opposite arm and leg moving. So crossing the midline of the body and doing contralateral movements and complex movements where you're doing two and three movements combined together especially if you're doing a rocking and rolling type pattern with your body is absolutely amazing for the brain. It's good for the posture. It's good for flexibility. It's good for balance. And it works your core in a way, like I said, that a one dimensional like crunch cannot afford you or do for you.
So two things really quick. One is um, just to highlight for people, because I haven't really thought about this until now. I mean, I've done a bunch of um, cross-body movement stuff over the years, but what's one of the things that's going on is pretty simple. And that is if you're, let's say we're going to be using your right hand to tap your left knee, Mm -hmm. your right hand is controlled by the left side of your brain. Your right knee is controlled by the uh, left knee is controlled by the right side of your brain. So at the very least, you're getting these two movements um, simultaneously activating other opposing sides of your brain. And then there's the whole balance component that has to go in to make those things happen. So I've haven't, uh, it, it occurs to me now, I've never seen EEG or um, MRI info on what happens when we're doing these things. But at the simplest level, the fact that you're doing movements that require you to use two uh, part of your brain on each side is a sort of interesting thing. And also another thing for those, again, either watching or listening, Kevin, I don't know if you have anything available to do it, but if you have a beverage to get any more energy, I think that would probably be helpful for you. <laughs> well, I got my water bottle right here. Yeah, perfect. That's the one I was thinking of. And by, by the way, for anyone watching, um, please tell people what your shirt says, because I totally adore it. Okay. The shirt says Mountain Dude, D-U-D-E, like the dude from- uh, um, Dude of Bob's. Yeah, the dude abides. Exactly. I was, I, I, the car in front of me at the stoplight on the way to physical therapy this morning had a, a stick bumper sticker that was the dude abides. Nice. So that was at the top of my brain. Yeah. So, all right. So, so, so. Um, uh, these are interesting patterns, and I totally get what the neurological effect would be. But can you give, um, other than doing, you know, that sort of cross crawl thing of tapping your opposite uh, knee with your not opposite hand. Um, and you gave another one um, that was a dumbbell one. Give me that one again in slow motion. And then if you could throw another one just for the fun, because these are really interesting. Okay. So the dumbbell one would be holding the dumbbell in your right hand. Yes. Yeah. From a standing position, lift your left foot off the ground and then lower the dumbbell down to where your left foot was and kick your left leg behind you. So you're balancing on one leg. Balance is another key thing. You're crossing the middle line of your body at an angle. And then you come up to a position like this and you pull the dumbbell in and you pull your knee up in the air and hold it opposite. And then you do a press and then you tuck it back in and then you lower it back down and you come back up and you do a press. So multiple things are happening here. You're, you have to concentrate on balancing. You have to concentrate on crossing the middle line of your body. You have to concentrate on your form and make sure you have good technique and you got to memorize the reps you're doing. So just think (laughs) all that brain engagement, instead of me putting you on a machine, a chest press machine where you grab two handles and say, do set of 10 and you just push out like this 10 times. What benefit is that giving you? Yeah, you're building well, your back well, and stuff. Well, but. let's be let's let's be clear. To say that it's not giving you a benefit, of course, is a bit of a, 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 a stretch. Yeah, it is. I mean, it 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 is making those muscles stronger in a very particular way that can be useful and moving on. But what you're talking about is a different game. Yeah. And so I so I don't want to conflate the two and um, suggest that one is is completely bad because we're really talking about two different universes in a way. Right. Yeah. One is, demonstrably building strength or, or, or size of hypertrophy. And the other is really doing a whole, what you're describing is a whole different neurological thing that can have different kinds of uses, which, and I want to highlight something. What you're describing is, how do I want to say this? It was a number of years ago when functional fitness became the buzzword of the day. Yeah. And it- trying to imitate some of the things that you actually do in your daily life. Now, arguably deadlifting is similar to grabbing a bag of groceries and picking them up. Um, But what you're talking about is a whole different thing even than that, because it's not trying to imitate these daily movements, but it's doing things that actually I can see how they would impact your ability to move daily because you're dealing with balance. You're dealing with agility. You're dealing with having to keep these things, you know, all in play at the same time, which is really interesting. Yeah, I'm going to rewind a little bit and then I'm going to move back forward. Um, I wasn't actually throwing, uh, you know, the chest presses and stuff under the bus. There's a time and place for everything in the world. And your muscles don't know the difference between a push up, a seated chest press or a barbell or dumbbell bench press or any of that. And there is a time and place for all of it. And and yes, you can build strength, muscle, the whole nine yards. And if that is your goal, that's totally fine. And I I train people who are, um, you know, they have balance issues or their foot is in a cast. And I have to you know, resort to machines and stuff. And that's totally fine. So I don't want any of you to think I'm I'm some kind of elitist and say, oh, it's all crap. It's not (laughs) a place for everything. But what I do, I'm not going to use the word specialize. What I do love to incorporate into my training. I've already changed your life. (laughs) You've done it. You changed me already. I've seen the light. (laughs) Um, What I do like to incorporate is a level that's, I feel a higher level than functional fitness. There's functional fitness. Yes. And deadlifts are, you know, any kind of exercise really is functional. That, That gets taken for granted a lot that term and i don't really like to use it because you know bicep curls are technically functional when you reach for a, a glass of kombucha and you go like this especially if it's off the tap and it's nice and cold and delicious 
That's a bicep curl right there, light one. But if you do bicep curls like this in the gym, hammer curls, it's the exact same thing. So everything can be functional technically. But Wait, hold on, hold on. I've got I, you, you. reminded me of something I used to I used to say as a joke, which is um, I don't call bowling a sport when <laughs> the muscles you use for that for that activity are the same muscles you use for drinking. Um, <laughs> That's a good one. Yeah. <laughs> so well, I haven't bowled, I haven't bowled in forever. But me? anyway. Yeah. Yeah, I need to, I need to go bowling again. That's a fun sport. That's probably that's got a good bit of neurological load involved too, because you got to like hit the right arrows and all that kind of stuff. It's a whole other conversation. But yeah, that's a going back to your original question. I would say, you know, I, I the month of July is usually my busiest month in Park City here from a training perspective at the gym because a lot of people come into town for the summer or for the month of July for some reason, and I kind of put people through protocols they're, they're completely unfamiliar with. And they're like, oh my, after the session, their eyes are like this big, they're drenched with sweat. And they're yeah, like, yeah. I, I've been working out with this, this you know, body, former bodybuilder who owns a gym in Florida where this guy is from Florida. And he's like, I don't, I've never done anything like this in my life. He goes, this is so much better than those workouts. He's like, I think I'm going to fire him when I go back home. Like literally people tell me that. And they're like, oh, can you write down all these workouts and stuff? I said, I'm already a step ahead of you. I have, them, I have them written down. I have them all ready to go just in case. <laughs> he's like, you are the man. And I'm like, I am to please. <laughs> so, because I know how complicated they can be. And that is the best. That's the most fun part. You said the word fun earlier. Yeah. Movement. I mean, it couldn't be the movement movement could be a better title for your show and challenging yourself with cross body patterns. Even if you just engage in like one different exercise a week, I don't, I don't tell people like, yeah, you should change all your workouts up and just do this completely. That's, that's not true. It's like start small and work your way upward and try one challenging movement every week, work on it, practice it or a month even, and then add another one and then add another one. And that's kind of where I started like many, many years ago when I was a young scra strapping lad in Northeast Pennsylvania, when I, where I started out. I had limited wait, wait, hold, on. hold on. Where in Northeast Pennsylvania? Scranton, Wilkes-Barre area. God, a small I, know I know it very, very well. I went to a summer camp out there. Yeah. No way. Yeah. In Scranton? No, um, a little bit outside of Scranton, uh, maybe 20 minutes outside in Shahola, Pennsylvania, which oh, is yeah. really Pennsylvania, which one of my best friends calls me one day. He'd made a bunch of money and he said, Hey, uh, I'm in my, I just bought a summer house. I said, where? He goes, oh, you'll never guess it. Uh, you won't know it. It's in the middle of nowhere in Pennsylvania. I said, where? He goes, it's called Shahola, Pennsylvania. I said, do me a favor, walk outside your house, take a right, walk for a hundred yards and tell me what you see. He goes, uh, it's the entrance to Camp Shahola for boys. I went, That's where I went for six years. So, um, so wow. I know that neighborhood well. The Twin Lakes area. I mean, you're talking my favorite thing. I, um, but regarding, independent of that, um, because I'm sitting here with this thing going on with my arm and my shoulder, I, what you just what you said about just people's eyes lighting up and just having much fun. I'm doing the dumbest version of what you described right now. I have a pulley where I'm just holding the pulley with my left hand, the one that's out of whack, and using my right arm to pull my arm up and down just for passive range of motion. And when I do it, I just get blissed out. It's like a very mild form of doing some you know, contralateral stuff. But you're right. It just does something in your brain that is just really, really pleasant. Yeah. So my uh, wish to everybody is always just Try to do some form of cross body patterns or movement on a daily basis. And it doesn't have to be complicated. It could be body weight, like I just mentioned. Oh, and you asked me before to, to give you another example, I think, yeah. right? Yeah. Okay. So I got a great one. Okay. Lying on your back, you grab two kettlebells and you do a chest press and you hold them like this up in front of your chest like this and you raise your legs up in the air. And what you do is you lower your right arm and you windshield wipe your legs to the left as your right arm is coming down. <laughs> then you, as your right arm's going up, your left arm's coming up and your legs are coming up and then they go the opposite direction. So when your legs windshield wiper to the right, your right arm is in the air and your left arm is coming down. And then you completely opposite. You go back and forth in a seesaw pattern and your legs go one way and your arm goes the other way. That's a uh, brilliant one. It's in, my, it's in my protocol right now. Yeah. Me and my girlfriend have been doing it and she loves it. It's like one of her favorite exercises. How have you either found or developed these things? I, I was about to tell you the story about Pennsylvania back early 2000s. I was confined to a small space in my mom's basement where I had my, my DP weight set from, the, from high school still there. I was working for a glass sculptor at the time. I was heavy into fitness and, and lifting and like studying exercise, nutrition, diet, the whole nine yards. I lost my job with him. And then I got right into fitness, health and fitness. I went and got my degree. I got certified the whole nine yards. But I was going over to her house. She lived about a mile and a half from where I was living at the time. And I was working out in her basement instead of going to the gym that was right next to the place where I used to work for convenience sake. I'm like, well, I'm not going to the gym anymore. I canceled my membership and whatever. So I ended up having to work out in this small space, maybe um, 10 foot by 10 foot, old DP weight set 
We had a pull-up bar made out of wood that my dad made when we were like Boy Scouts, young kids, under the stairway. And then I had this beam in the, in the open floor system in, in the basement. And the height of it, I barely had enough space to do a press. I had to go in between the bays to do a press like this. So there was like a, a beam right between me. And I do a press and the closest I get the dumbbells was an inch and a half apart. So it taught me good form <laughs> where they wouldn't clank together. So I had to get creative is the bottom line. And I'm like, what, what can I do to get great workouts with minimal equipment and a lot of body weight? And I just started, it was, I was like a mad scientist down there. I was like Einstein trying to figure out how to reinvent the light bulb or electricity. And I just started doing crazy exercises, one foot, one leg, cross body things from plank positions. I'd be doing renegade rows and I lift one leg as I'm doing a renegade row and I do side lateral raises. And that's kind of where it all started. And then it's like I told you, you start small and you grow tall. And I started out with small basic movements and then I got more complicated, more complex as time went on. And then it all just started staying in my brain. And here we are 20 years plus years later, and I've accumulated quite a, cat a catalog and an encyclopedia of movements and exercises that I could re resort to just like this. So that's kind of how it happened. It I, can imagine, I can imagine though, I mean, so at what point were you starting to train people and when did you inject these things? And I can imagine if, if it were me, that the first time I was going to say to someone, hey, here's this crazy thing for you to do, um, there might've been some trepidation at the very least. Mm -hmm. Well, I probably... I mean, I started factoring these kind of movements in right at the beginning of my career, probably like 01 or 02, to a small level. And what I realized was I could have someone sit on a bench and do lat pull downs, and that's great. So I would have them do that, but then I'm like, let's do something a little bit more complex. So I'd have them get in a quadruped position on their hands and their knees with a pattern in their knees. And then I'd have them extend their arm and their leg out like this with their arm and leg in a perfectly straight line. And then I have them bring their knee to their elbow and I'd have them curl their spine. I'd say, squeeze your abs, now extend back out. And I'd have them do like 10 and 10 on each side. And they'd get up and they'd smile. And they're like, they were really excited about it. And like, wow, that was a cool exercise. I never did that before. Nowadays, <laughs> that's a pretty common exercise, I feel, out in space. Yeah. But a lot yeah. of people don't know why it's cool. And one of the reasons why is because of that cross-body effect. It lights the brain up like a Christmas tree. So both hemispheres of the brain get lit up. They do something like that. And then I have them do lat, pulls, lat pull downs again. And then that's how I started integrating it in with workouts. And then I would just do, I'm like, well, someone's like, well, my balance is crap. I need to fix my balance when I was interviewing them before we trained. I'm like, okay, well, I'll have you do standing, um, alternating marching bicep curls. So you're going to hold dumbbells and then you're going to do a bicep curl and you're going to lift your right leg, then you're going to lift your left leg. And that may seem simple to you or I, but to the average person that's never done anything like that, other than just standing still, it makes it really complicated for them because they're like, wait, which leg was it? And you'd be shocked at how people fumble around and they can't get like the, the simple, to me, the simplest pattern. So I kept integrating little things like that into workouts. And then it became two or three movements. Then it became four. And then people came to me specifically for that. Like, I saw you training this guy and you're doing this really weird exercise where you're spinning over in a plank position and pulling your knee to your elbow and blah, blah, blah. And they're like, I want to train with you. And I'm like, okay, cool. And I want to learn some of those patterns. And it, it just eventually evolved to a point where I, I do predominantly, my workouts are probably 90% that stuff and like 10% conventional or beefcake, whatever you want to call it now. So that's how it happened. I like conventional or beefcake, but more, you, you have given me my favorite multiple mixed metaphor ever of Einstein reinventing the light bulb. Yeah. That is that there's, there's so much to unpack in there that I absolutely adore. So this is, this is all really fascinating. I'm also thinking um, it occurred to me that there's another phenomenon, a neural, neural phenomenon that we're talking about with these patterns, which is whenever you are trying to learn a new movement pattern, like you're, you've got one that you're kind of ingrained with and you're trying to learn a new one. So to go from running, you know, over striding and heel striking in regular shoes to proper natural running form, either barefoot or uh, minimalist footwear, there's a, f a feeling that we get that we will label frustration, which is what's going on when you're trying to break out of an existing neural pathway and lay down a new one. But what you're introducing is something that's so novel. There's not an existing one in place. So I can easily imagine that's one of the other reasons why people have this somewhat euphoric experience, because that laying down of something new, that opening something new is really fun. It's like I, I, I have, let's say I have nominal experience with drugs, basically none. Um, but but I do know, and certainly people talk about this, if you take some drug, MDMA or whatever you might be taking, the first time is like, holy crap. And then often after that, it's not quite the same because that first time of laying down that new neural pathway is the mind blowing thing. And after you've got that one, you're kind of just going down the same path and it's not going to have that same pattern interrupting, you know, novel thing. So you're, you know, introducing a whole bunch of pattern interrupting novel things, which again, can give you that really, you know, super fun experience as you're doing things that are valuable. Yeah, totally. And 
there is a very fast effect of these three-dimensional movement patterns that I'm describing. For example, people that I have doing them in, a, in the first time I have them do it in a session, that they're like sometimes all over the place and they're frustrated and they even get angry sometimes, not at me, just at themselves. Like I'm so uncoordinated, blah, blah, blah. Uh -uh. After we do it like the third, literally the third time through and they get it, they get up and they're just like, I can't believe I did that. I can't believe I got it. And I said, all you got to do is be calm. Chill uh -huh. is the word, my friend. So practice makes perfect, but perfect practice makes even better perfect. And yeah. when you do this, it's like, it's got a fast return on investment. You can get these things dialed in faster than you think. And yeah, the first time you learn something, it's like going to a dance class or a swing class or something. You're going to be all over the place with dance class or, you know, learning instruction from somebody. But as time goes on, you're going to get smooth and you're going to get better. That's why dancing is super good for the brain too. Yeah. There's, um, uh, there was research that came out probably about 13 years ago, right after we started the business. And um, it was from Kirk Erickson, who was at the university, I think of Pittsburgh at the time, don't hold me to it. And he had been studying elderly people who either walked or didn't walk and not, I mean, because they couldn't walk. I mean, they either like had a practice of walking for some amount of time every day or they didn't. And he tracked these people uh, and maybe he gave them an assignment. Maybe he you know, took a group of people and had half of them do a walking practice and the other not. Um, I don't remember. But uh, the interesting thing is he was he did a brain fMRI at the beginning of the study. It was a long study, like a nine-year study, and along the way and again at the end. And what he found is the people who were walking retained more gray matter in their brain. And I asked him why he thought that was. And he goes, the stimulation from walking, both you know, moving your body and just what you see when you're around. You know, you can't you have to pay attention to what you're walking on, what you're walking in, where you're walking, and what you see around you in a way that otherwise you don't have. And I said to him, imagine what it would have been like if they were barefoot and he was like oh uh. <laughs> now we, yeah we didn't have the cash to recreate that time cash or time to recreate that study to see what the effect would be but it seemed pretty obvious that adding the extra stimulation component would have been interesting yeah and also when you're walking you're doing a contralateral movement it's like your yeah. right arm and left leg right arm left opposite opposite so anytime you do that it's similar to uh, crossing the midline contralateral movement is just as good so those two components right there have to do with walking. And if you're walking outside, then you've got ecotherapy. You're exposed to the sun, to the wind, to the smells out there, the evergreen trees, the, the, the foliage in the wind in the fall, the petrichor in the summer when it's raining. All these different factors bleed into it. And that all improves brain function. And, and in my opinion, it reverses the aging process. And I think it's quintessential for, you know, people talk about biohacking. That's a big buzzword. I've been doing biohacking, some form of biohacking for decades. And it's all of a sudden this big, huge buzzword. That's all you hear about is biohacking, yeah. longevity, reverse the aging process, 30s and new 50, all these different, or vice versa, 50s, new 30, and all these different things. And I'm like, well, yeah, it's true. You just got to go out there and walk for 20 minutes a day, get some sun exposure, get some vitamin D boost in your system. It's all very simple, basic things, really. People need to well, focus on you brought up one that um, in our very brief conversation before we started this this chat uh, that I definitely want to hit on, especially with the intro about things being maybe not quite what you think. Let's talk about the sun, shall we? Let's let's talk about the sun. All right. I, love I just gave you the intro. You're up. <laughs> okay. Um, well, I just spent, uh, I would say, eight months in a row with heavy, heavy snow and darkness here in Park City. We broke the record for snowfall, all-time record. And you're in Colorado. You probably had a similar effect out there. But like we didn't have two consecutive days of sun for like, I think it was eight months in a row. March, it snowed every day except three days. And believe me, I love snow. Don't get me wrong. But it just kept dragging and dragging and dragging. And season seasonal affective disorder is a big deal. It's a big thing. It's very serious. I actually did a YouTube video on it back in like March to try to calm people down because all everyone I knew, my clients and like friends and people were, were they were just so they just started getting really frustrated and angry mid like March and stuff. And I'm like. You realize you're, you're getting affected by seasonal affective disorder, right? And some of them are like looking around left and right. They didn't think about it. And I'm like, it's been snowing since mid-October. It's been dark. We haven't had any much sun. And everybody loves snow in Park City. But most people were complaining about it eventually. And they're like, it's just too much. I'm, I'm done. I'm over it. I'm sick of shoveling. I'm sick of this, sick of that. I can't get around in traffic. And I just thought I stayed calm the whole time. And I'm like, I just got to stay calm and recognize it and keep awareness going. So seasonal affective disorder is a big deal. And it should be treated as such. And I like to do anything possible to keep my mental health high. And I try to encourage other people to do the same thing. So it's very real and it needs to be addressed. And I don't think that's addressed enough either. And the cross-body patterns work perfectly for that too. Well, there's another thing that you mentioned about um, being in the sun. 
Oh yeah. Oh, the sun. Okay. Yeah. So the sun. The sun that thing. Big when thing, you're thing up in the sky. Yes. 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 So uh, what I was getting at was there was a big lack of sun during that whole time, and that's why yeah. people are getting. That was a major reason why people are getting the seasonal affective disorder. I suggest getting as much sun exposure as you, not as much as you can, a minimum of 20 minutes of sun exposure on the front side of your body and back side of your body every single day that the sun is out, a maximum amount of, of skin exposure to the sun. And yes, board shorts are totally fine. One of my rituals every day in the summer, non-negotiable. And I tell everybody this that I, that I work for and I tell clients and everything. I need to have that sun exposure. Every, I, need like, I need like one hour a day to lay in the sun this way, lay in the sun on my stomach. I'm good. No sunscreen, no nothing. If I'm going to be out for multiple hours, I have, as you can see, no hair. So I will put sunscreen on my head, my nose, my ears, like areas that are going to be like the sun's going to be beating down. But I use organic sunscreen with all ingredients I can pronounce, or I'll use shea butter, or I'll come up with a concoction that's all natural and all clean, because I do not like conventional sunscreen or sun, um, whatever the other stuff is called, um, sunblock, whatever the heck it is. All those chemicals, I don't like them. The sun, the skin is the biggest organ in the body. It absorbs everything in sight. What you want your skin to absorb is the sun itself. And when that happens, vitamin D gets released in the body. Vitamin D is a very important nutrient for boosting the immune system, boosting brain health, boosting hormone function in males. When men are exposed to the sun for, I think it's 20 to 30 minutes with as much skin exposure as possible, testosterone rises by 210%. I read that in a study once. I don't remember where, I just remember reading it. And that is miraculous, especially for guys that are 40 plus, 50 plus and so on. They want to get a natural boost of testosterone. The easiest way to do that is lay in the sun. Go for a walk in the sun. So that, and the reason your mood boosts through the roof is because of the vitamin D being released in your system. That's a mood booster. So any of you out there listening or watching, wonder why when you go to the beach, your mood goes through the roof. It's not necessarily because you unplug from work and you have a week of freedom. It's because you're probably in the sand, you're in water, you're, you're smelling nice smells from the, the breeze of the ocean coming in, and you're getting sun exposure. So you have a multitude of factors happening that's boosting your mood right there. So what would you say to people who, like my wife, are um, pasty white people? Mm -hmm. And yes. like for her, for her, literally 20 minutes in the sun, especially here in Colorado, she'd, yeah. be, she'd be practically literally toast. This is an easy answer. You start with five minutes mm -hmm. and then you work your way up. No, she'll still get barbecued? Uh Fine with, fine with me. Actually, I don't know. I mean, oh. she she just uh, she avoids it. She's you know Northern European, just super super white, and yeah. very very sensitive to it. And I know a few, but some people like that. Others, um, I'm I'm uh, the opposite. I mean, I'm totally fine. I rarely get burned, etc. Yeah. Well, like I said, it's uh, you build your you build an immunity up to it, just like anything else. So I would start out with like five minutes at a time. Test test her levels. She should test her levels. See how long she could tolerate it, and then just slowly increase it. And then in the event that she does need a sunscreen or some kind of blocker, I would just get something that's organic and clean and stay away from all the, you know, hydrobenzoic, blah, 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 that I can't even pronounce, whatever those long words are. You got to be clear of those. We should, uh, we should definitely make, make some sort of supplement where the ingredients are blah, 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 blah. I think that would be very entertaining <laughs> just to see who even notices. That is the, probably no one would even care. And then at the end, it says zinc oxide. <laughs> <laughs> Your results may vary. Yeah, so, results uh, may vary. So we've so we have we haven't taken down fitness, but we've added a new level of fitness. We've certainly added something new to play with um, when it comes to sun exposure, or you know, because people have definitely been told stay the hell out um, mm -hmm. in a way that is that is arguably quite arguably um, problematic. FYI, you know, in here in the Denver Boulder area, for us, um, we I don't think we've had that kind of haven't seen the sun in that long. But what's so funny is if we have three, maybe four days of not sun in a row, the newspaper headlines are apocalyptic. Uh, oh, personally, really? It's like being in Seattle and they start freaking out. But oh, wow. there's headlines about how horrible the world is. Wow. Um, or like four days of not seeing the sun. People lose their minds very quickly over here. Wow. That is, that's a fast return. Now, normally in Park City, during the summer, it's usually gorgeous here. Sunny all oh, the yeah. time, clear skies, blue. And we had, a good, we had a good run from like June 26th until about two days ago. It's, it was clear and beautiful finally. And I was like, oh, I just drank it all in. I loved it. And then it got cloudy again a couple of days ago. And now we're back to sunny again. And it's supposed to stay sunny again. And I hope it just keeps on trucking all the way to the end of August if I, if I had a perfect world. But we'll uh, see what happens. Yeah, we will definitely see what happens. It is, it's definitely different than it's ever been here. So now we're the middle of July. And uh, it, it's unbelievably green. The, the hills are all green. Yeah. 
which Same is here. so rare. Yeah. Uh, we've had it happen like once in August where things were still green before they got all brown. But this is, this is like, I've been here 30 years. This is like the second, maybe third time I've seen things being this green, this late in the season. Yeah. It's crazy. It's crazy. Good actually. Cause it is uh, yeah. brown and dry. no complaints. All right. Yeah. So what else is on our, what else is our, on our things that you specialized list that make, uh, might make people go, Hey, wait a minute. What? Um, I would say gut health. I think we should talk about gut health. Let's do it. Okay. So uh, according to the, I don't know who it is, CDC or um, somebody out there, NIH or somebody, the average amount of fiber, daily fiber intake is 25 grams for women, 30 grams for men. But- Wait, wait, and, that's, you think that's the actual average? That's what, that's what the recommendation is. Yeah, I was going to say, because the average is like nothing for most people. Yes, correct. And not enough people pay attention to dietary fiber, in my opinion. It's like the unspoken- you know, nutrient or mineral, I guess you would call it in the diet that's, that's missing from most people's diets. Cause the average person is more fixated these days on macros. I gotta get my macros. Gotta get my protein. Always. Oh, you see these influencers and these, these health and fitness experts on YouTube pl- plastering up the place and they get really close to the screen real serious. And they're like, always prioritize protein, always prioritize protein. That's all they talk about. And you see real after real after real about this has 45 grams of protein and blah, 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 amount of carbs. And yeah, keep your carbs down if you want to live a long life. And I completely disagree with that. I think you should follow a balanced diet and every meal should be balanced with a good source of protein, a good source of carbohydrates and a healthy source of fat. But I think you should prioritize fiber Mm. because most people don't get 25 to 30 grams. I eat two meals a day. I follow a time-restricted eating protocol, which is a form of fasting. And I literally get 55 to 60 grams of of fiber a day, not protein. I, I get enough protein. I get, you know, I don't, I don't count protein. If I was to count anything, I would count fiber. And I try to get a minimum of 55 to 60 grams. And the so reason. That, yeah, ahead. well, no, good for the reason. I'm going to, well, but I'm going to prime you so you can keep going after you say the reason is um, for many people, even the idea of what you just said seems incomprehensible. So you're definitely going to have to say how you're packing 55 grams of fiber into two meals. Okay. So, but get there. Okay. So let's talk about the importance first. When you have the high amount of fiber, it's able to work its way down into your small intestine when you have the higher amount of fiber and it populates the good bacteria in your stomach. You may know it as probiotics or gut flora and probiotics actually exist in your stomach already. People are always telling me, oh, my gut's out of of whack. I'm going to Whole Foods to get a probiotic. And I'm like, no, you're not. You're going to Whole Foods to buy a supplement that's going to be found in a sewage system somewhere down the street in a day or two. That's what you're buying. Because I don't believe probiotics are the, the catch-all, do-all to improving gut health. It's a, it's a multiple stage process that involves eating prebiotic foods, increasing your fiber intake, slowing down the frequency of your meals, meaning eat less meals, and slowly increasing your fiber intake. Just like your wife, uh, when I said five minutes of sun exposure a day, start out with 10 grams of fiber a day if you're getting zero, if you're getting five grams a day. And then do that for two weeks, then increase it to 15, then increase it to 20, then increase it to 25. Because people are like, okay, they'll have fiber, I'll be in the bathroom all day, or I'll have bad gas and everything else. You will if you go from 10 grams of fiber to 60 overnight. Yeah, of course you will. But you slowly work your way up, your, your stomach expands, it gets used to it, and you're off to the races and you're good to go. And once you get to that level, it's easy to maintain it. So how do I get that many grams of fiber in two meals? I incorporate psyllium powder, number one, in my first meal of the day. And in that first meal, I also have a high amount of fiber in there, such as berries, bananas. Bananas are prebiotic. They're really good. And then I have other things now that have a good amount of fiber in them. I use plant-based protein powders that have digestive enzymes built into them, and they have a good amount of fiber. So my first meal will be like 20 to 25 grams of fiber. And then the second meal, I'll include things like beans. I'll include things like whole grains. I eat these low-carb wraps that literally have 15 grams of fiber each in them, and I'll have two of them. And there's 30 grams right there alone. So my meal ends up being like, I'll have sometimes 40, I could tolerate 45 to 50 grams of fiber in one meal because my body's adapted to it. And over time, that's how I did it. So it's a slow, progressive process. And I eat a lot of cruciferous vegetables, which are high in fiber as well, like broccoli, cauliflower, kale, um, Brussels sprouts, and these different things, all of which also help males specifically lower the estradiol levels in the body, which helps increase testosterone by default. So that's a, that's a little hack for like reversing the aging process and keeping hormones optimized as well. So that's kind of how you get to that point. And then, and then if you take a probiotic and your gut is already in good shape, you're going to reinforce the good gut bacteria by having your, your probiotics. And then I eat things like sauerkraut, kimchi, tempeh, kombucha. I eat a lot of fermented foods, pickled things, 
um, like olives and like pickled beets and stuff like that. So you want to incorporate all these kind of foods into your diet and all that stuff contributes to better gut health. And then if you were to trigger your system with a 24 hour fast once in a while, it sends a bunch of um, populated stem cells through your gut to help populate the good bacteria as well. And that is a trick of the trade as well that comes into fasting. Do you have a thought on resistant starch? Love it. I think it's great. Um, From, like green so bananas I'll, and stuff. Well, I'll describe, I'll, I'll describe what it is for people with, with a bit of a story. Many years ago, like 25 years ago, um, there was a bookstore in Boulder that was closing. And I went to see if I could find something. And there was a book on resistant starch. And the idea was basically you can have all the carbs you want and they're going to be good for you. And I'm reading this thing. And the gist of it is that when you take a starch like even pasta or rice, anything that's you know high in carbohydrates, you cook it and then let it get cold. When it's getting cold, the the basically the carbohydrate molecules rearrange themselves into something that's very hard to digest. And um, and I'm reading this going, that sounds like the biggest piece of crap, pun intended, that I've ever heard <laughs> in my life. And I just put the book down. It was a dollar. I didn't get it. <laughs> 10 years later, resistant starch became like the big thing Amazing. and showing what an amazing thing it is. And so like the idea of a cold pasta salad, leftover spaghetti, I mean, all these things are can actually be really good for you because suddenly you're not digesting um, as many of those carbs, not that carbs are bad, but you're getting more fiber as a result of this, um, which, you know, people thought was completely crazy. And here it is. It's a real thing. So um, that book was ahead of its time. And I would, it was a little too, too dumb to recognize it. Uh, well, what you're describing also, uh, potatoes fall into that category. A lot of people are scared. Potatoes. Yeah. People are scared to death to eat potatoes or scared to death of corn and carrots and stuff. I'm like, take your potatoes, cook them. If you're scared of them, put them in the fridge overnight. It's going to do Exactly what you said. And it's also going to lower the glycemic index of said potatoes as well. Right. So if you want to enjoy your potatoes, eat them cold. I eat cold food all the time. Love it. I love cold pasta. I love cold potatoes. The cold sweet potatoes are amazing. And we, you can take. Yeah. It's so funny you say that. We have a whole bunch of cold purple sweet potatoes. Love them. They're my favorite. Oh my God. So good. Yeah. They're the highest in antioxidants too. The purple ones. That's why I like them. I did not know. We just have someone in our office who uh, was trying to make a business of uh, doing uh, purple potato, purple sweet potato recipes and products and whatnot, and did not go as well as he was hoping. Um, and, but still does it just as his like daily life. And so he's always giving us these purple sweet potato. I don't even know what to call them. They're not brownies, but they may as well be because mm -hmm. the ingredients are purple sweet potatoes and a little bit of chocolate. And mm -hmm. oh my, oh my, they are good for you and addictive. That's interesting. You mentioned that because I met a guy a few, like five years ago, who was in Park City, who was a friend of a friend who was launching a business. He, I thought he was from Hawaii or something. And, and he had like these mush things that were made from purple sweet potatoes. And he had right. chocolate and like all these different flavors. And it sounds very similar to what you're talking about. And I don't know if, that, if that's still up and running or not, but holy smoke, they were delicious. And they're like a dessert. Yeah. And you know, I don't even like regular sweet potatoes. Uh, this is going to sound funny. They feel too sweet to me, but uh -huh. purple sweet potatoes, just, just totally perfect. I mean, oh, man, yeah. I'm completely addicted. Yeah. They, they work... Uh, they work good in smoothies, to be honest with you, or yeah, yeah. smoothie bowls. And like, you can, they're, they're very versatile. You can, you can use them in multiple ways. And I have. Uh, in fact, my wife has been putting them in her smoothies. So she yeah. doesn't, she's not a big fan of doing, I, I, I'm a big fan of frozen bananas in a smoothie. She is not. So she's doing purple sweet potatoes and same effect of kind of making it a little more thick, a little more rich, a little more flavorful. Yeah, um, yeah it's, it's a good one. Um, and I do not have a purple sweet potato business. Oh, Just okay. You know, I'm just saying. Yeah. So, all right. So, all right. We've got sun. We have um, non-functional, functional workouts. We have gut health. Anything else we want to jump into? Shall we talk about barefoot running? Yeah. Um, I've heard of it. Um, I'm not have sure. you heard of it? Yeah. Um, hmm. I mean, I, there was a book. Uh, I don't remember what it was. There was a song from Springsteen, something. I don't know. Some Something about that. Yeah. I, so how did you discover uh, getting out of your shoes and and doing something with your bare feet like running? Well, it started for me around 2008 or nine is when I started to get entrenched in it. And then by 2010, I was completely unshod and I've never looked back since, no pun intended. But one of the biggest things I've noticed from my transition from shoes to no shoes was when I'd, work, when I'd run with actual shoes on and just strike any which way, I would be toast for the rest of the day. I, yeah. I like to do hill repeats and like on steep hills and stuff and sprint training and that kind of thing. And I would literally be... Like my legs would just be burned to a crisp and exhausted and tired, lethargic, sore the whole nine yards. And literally the first time I, I did like a four foot strike run, when I went through the, the, the whole transition period, I noticed I didn't have nearly as much pain in my legs. 
and my exhaustion level was way down. And I was like, what just happened here? Uh, there's something to this. Then I got rid of my, my regular crap shoes with the big spongy heels. And I got myself some uh, Converse All-Stars and I started running with a flat, a flat sold shoe, zero heel drop. And then it got even less, like the pain even got even less. And then as I got thinner and thinner with my shoes, I worked my way down to like a one millimeter shoe. And I'm like, I can't believe this. I have like no lethargy in my legs whatsoever the rest of the day. And then when I became completely barefoot, I was like, this is, why is no one else doing this? Why does the world not know about it? And I'm like, and the impact factor, like my knees would hurt, my, my hips would kind of hurt when I'd run with shoes on. All that disappeared completely. I mean, completely. And I'm now 50, I'm still running barefoot. And I'm like, I never feel joint pain with my knees or my ankles or my, my hips, none of that stuff. I mean, I got a little, couple little nagging injuries here and there, but, but nothing compared to what I did when I was in my 20s running with shoes on. So all these epiphanies occurred and I was like, oh my goodness. And like, when your foot actually touches the ground, the earth, it just feels so, you just feel so connected. It's so different. And your mood literally goes up. It's like, you know, we could debate all, the, all day about the earthing and like electrons and neutrons and all that stuff hitting your body and, and pressure points hitting your feet and all these different things. But just the fact that you're barefoot and you're connected to the earth, it just feels different. And it makes you even that runner's high in the endorphin release you get when you run period. It's just 10 times more magnified when you're barefoot. And the, all those benefits are rolled into the fact of why I did it and why I started transitioning. Because I really started to study, why, do you, why would you want to run barefoot? And it was because of like the aches and pains during the day that I, I wanted to transition and see if that was different. And it was different. And it really, really spoke to me. So, and then I just started working out barefoot in the grass, doing kettlebell workouts and circuit workouts and dumbbells. And I worked out my mom's basement barefoot. And I would be barefoot in our gym, but I'm not allowed to be. So I, I, I wear one millimeter shoes. I just slip them on to like slippers, which my vote for zero shoes is next phase of your business. You should create a, a zero shoe or like a one millimeter slip on. Well, I'll tell you the simple reason that we don't. Okay. It, it's because people do everything you can think of in every shoe that we make. Yeah. And if we go down to one millimeter, um, the, we, well, the joke is our 5,000 mile sole warranty is if you wear the soles down to less than a millimeter, we'll replace them for a you know, significant discount. But oh. when you go down to one millimeter, knowing that people are going to go do things in the shoes beyond oh. what you're describing, they're going to blow through them in no time. So uh. when you something durable enough for people to actually use them and enjoy them. Um, but um, I mean, the closest thing we have, we have both our, we have a Genesis sandal, which is about four mil, which is crazy flexible and lightweight and all the rest. And then our speed force uh, training shoe, which is the shoe I race and train in as a sprinter. That's about four and a half mil. Um, and the thing that's fun, I mean, I have one pair of the speed force I've been racing in for three seasons and they're still great. So, you know, part of our thing, one of our goals uh, is to keep things out of landfills because with footwear and apparel, there is no real mm, green solution. There is nothing that's really beneficial to the environment. Uh, there's a lot of people who are saying that the things they do are, but when you look closely, it's not quite what you think. I mean, we're using hemp canvas, for example. It's better than cotton canvas. We still use cotton on occasion. We still use wool on occasion. Um, we will do things that are made from recycled plastic, but we do not claim that we're changing the world because the recycled plastic is definitely taking trash out of the ecosystem, but it's not uh, carbon beneficial at this point. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's a, it, it, suffice it to say the, the green story is much more complicated than people want it to be. Mm -hmm. And there are people who are taking advantage of everyone liking simple stories by saying how they're saving the world by, you know, doing something that is not as beneficial as they actually claim. But anyway, so that's a bit of a tangent for why we're not doing something that's one mil at the moment. Gotcha. Well, that makes sense. I get it. And by the way, hemp is a I'm, that's a touchy subject with me as well, because oh, yeah. years and years and years, I'm talking like in the twenties and thirties, hemp was the crop that was used for all paper yeah. products and, and, you know, materials for clothing and everything. And then the newspaper companies started getting lobbying against it because they were losing money in bank and they wanted all the power and the money and they somehow got all the power and the money. And nowadays, if we started cultivating hemp, I'm not going to jump on my soapbox too heavily, but if we just start cultivating across the country, across the nation, and went back to using hemp crop to make all the paper products, all the clothing and everything else, it would like it would probably reverse the pollution epidemic we have and all the global warming that everyone throws out there. I'm like, get rid well, of the paper products. Yeah, I don't know if it's going to do, do that, but what it would do is it would free up a lot of water that's being used yes. by, by more water intensive crops. And that would be a big deal. And it is a plant that grows 
very fast and has, mm-hmm. like you said, so many uses, it would definitely be beneficial. And, um, and you're right, there are, there are financial slash political forces that are in the way of that happening at the moment. Um, yeah. It's really now the good news is that in the apparel space, it is being recognized as a valuable commodity. And so I think over time, we're going to start seeing more of that and more products that are made from uh, um, materials that are, or from crops that are less water intensive than say cotton. Um, hemp is one, bamboo is another. I mean, there are a handful of yeah. yeah, love- We'll see, but yeah. these things do not happen quickly, sadly. And and the other thing, not only do they not happen quickly, but there's a there's a bit of a problem because the communities that tend to adopt these quickly, um, I'm going to be a, a bit glib and a bit obnoxious when I say it this way. It's usually a bunch of rich white people, <laughs> and you know they get on their high horse about how they're saving the world, and then once they start seeing, you know, hey, I'm wearing hemp, and my friends are wearing hemp, they think that the job is done because they're in you know their own little environment. And uh, there's actually just, I, I complain about this all the time. We have some investors and they keep saying, you know, we really want to sell your sustainable story. I said, no, no, we're going to talk about how we make things that are durable and good for you and using less energy, et cetera. But that's not what we what we build our brand on. Our, our brand is built on natural movement. And the companies that are building their brand on sustainable are frankly, typically lying. And uh, And they keep saying to me, yeah, but people really want that. And I just read a study maybe two days ago that came out saying, yeah, most people do not make buying decisions based on sustainability over 70%. Don't care. They're yeah. just looking at the right thing at the right price. And I went, see, told you. So um, any, anyway, that, that is a whole other thing. How the hell did we get on a hemp? Where, where did that come from? I forgot where we were. Um, I don't uh, know. Uh, oh, oh, we're uh, talking about the minimal shoes. Things, yeah. yeah, barefoot things and then one millimeter, yeah. et cetera. So yeah. now people, if they've been paying attention, will say, okay, so you've gone mostly barefoot, but we were talking about all this snow in Park City. So what are you doing when it's cold and snowy, et cetera? I just wear regular winter boots when I'm like shoveling snow and stuff. But when I'm going around town, I wear Converse All-Stars or like a zero heel drop shoe, hard rubber sole. I haven't owned like a pair of, I've never owned a pair of Nikes because I just never supported Nike. That's just my personal preference. But, you know, like any kind of spongy workout shoe or cross trainer or those Jokas, I'm not going to say the actual name, but there's a shoe that rhymes with Joka that I don't really like that I see people walking around in and like, oh, I got all this padding on my foot. Look at me. And they're all smiley and stuff. I'm like, yeah, that's great. You're still pounding your heel into the ground and you're all, every single shock that you feel goes from your heel all the way up to your neck. And you may end up with back pain or neck pain or shoulder pain coming down the road. And when you cross a 50, 60 year old mark, those shoes are, I, I just cringe when I see people with them. And they're so like spongy. And, and I'm a big kettlebell guy too. And of kettlebells, you should be either barefoot or absolutely have a zero heel drop shoe on at the, at the most. Yeah. So you want your feet to like grab into the ground. And those, those big clunky shoes, I don't care what brand it is. Holy smoke. Yeah. That's just so damaging for the foot. And the toe boxes are like this and people get bunions and like all these different things. I'm just like, it just gives yeah. me. The it's, you know, the, and the, the reason that they became successful is twofold. One is it's an easy story to tell people you like cushioning. Here's more, more mm-hmm. has to be better. And yeah. the other is simply that the footwear industry is a bunch of um, uncreative copycats. So if something starts to take off, everybody jumps on the bandwagon because they're literally afraid they're going to go out of business if they don't. Yeah. So what's happened, like there was a trade show back in December uh, for footwear manufacturers and Every performance footwear company had a big, thick, giant padded shoe because of the ones that you're mentioning that started taking off a few years ago. Mm -hmm. And it's become a bit saturated. And the research is now starting to come out to prove everything you just said, which could not be more obvious if you know anything again about physics or kinesiology or anything else. Um, But uh, yeah, it's very, again, consumers like a simple story. Yeah. Cushioning feels good. Sit on a memory foam mattress feels good. Lie on a memory foam mattress feels good. Clearly, that's got to be good if I put it on my feet. And it can feel good, but like certain things that you eat, you know, taste good, not good for you. Same thing with your feet. Yeah, totally. That's, that's a whole whole other thing. And so I want to highlight, though, you are um, smart, which means that you're not going to be doing crazy things just, be, you know, just because you have an idea that you're supposed to be barefoot all the time. You know, you do what you need to do in the appropriate circumstance. Now, that said, there's a video of me. Um, I, I, I start promoting it every fall where I am shoveling snow in one of my super thin sandals, but I had a trick. I'd go out until I felt cold, and then I'd go back inside until I felt warm. Then I'd go back out till I felt cold. It would always take be a little longer. Then I'd go back out inside till I felt warm, which took a little less time. And by like the fourth time, I'm out for a half an hour shoveling snow, and yeah. it was fine. And similarly, and this is true for heat and cold. If it's super hot or super cold, 
Um, I pay attention to where I'm parking my car and what it's going to take to get from there to the entrance of whatever store I'm going to. Mm -hmm. And I don't just spend a ton of time outside uh, in bare feet on 100 degree pavement or on 20 degree pavement. I like, you know, think about it and arrange accordingly, which um, it, it's amazing. I talk to people and they go, ah, I don't want to have to work that hard. It's like, what do you, what? You just mm -hmm. you know, park and you look for where the white lines are and you walk on the white yes. lines. Yes. I've it's done like, it many times yeah, running barefoot. Yeah. yeah and it, when I, um, I have kind of a cutoff line of when I feel like it's safe to run barefoot out here in town. If I'm on blacktop and concrete, which I usually am because I run up main street and different places like that. And sometimes when I set out, I'm running on these paths that have all this shade and they're perfectly smooth and fine. And I'm on blacktop, no big deal. But then by the time I get done, I'm five miles into a run, I'm on my way back. It heats up a bit. And I'm like, Ooh, I'm going to have to look for a sidewalk and hit concrete because concrete doesn't heat up like blacktop blacktop. I mean, it'll, I've had blisters like this big on the bottom of my feet because I, I did not drop the ego and <laughs> I decided to run on really hot blacktop. Yeah. And it, just like you were saying, it's like you, you, I, I mean, it still goes back to, I'm going to use your wife's example again of exposing yourself to the sun for small amounts and then increasing it and eating a small amount of fiber and increasing it. And then running, um, wearing bare, minimalist shoes and then taking them off and running for a hundred feet and then put them back on, finish your run and then go 200 feet and then go 600 feet. And it's the same exact thing with the heat and cold exposure. Expose yep. yourself for 30 seconds one day, then try to get to 45 seconds the next week and then a minute and then two minutes and three minutes and keep on going. And I have run in the wintertime barefoot too. And oh, yeah. people look at me like I'm nuts. And I'm like, oh, it was like 28 degrees. Still, as can be beautiful, sunny sky. And in that case, I do want the blacktop to be hot and it worked out perfectly. It's complete opposite <laughs> yeah. of the summer. And I'd be out there chugging along barefoot and it was absolutely perfect. Well, so, I, I found over the years, it, it definitely seems like um, I have more capillaries and my circulation has changed because I'm when I'm out in the cold, my feet are almost always fine, whether I'm barefoot or in sandals or whatever, while my hands and head are freezing. Mm -hmm. So it's definitely, things definitely change. And that's similar. I just thought of it this way. Way back when, 40 years ago, I was doing biofeedback and I learned to change the temperature of my hands or my face or whatever, just by, I mean, I can't even describe how you learn to do it by having a device attached to you, telling you what your temperature is. And then you do a relaxation technique and just eventually your brain figures out how to change the way your blood is flowing. And I think this is just a variation on that same idea without the equipment, just the feedback of whether it's cold and um, um, barefoot Ken Bob, uh, he likes to say numb feet or dumb feet. Mm -hmm. And so that's the thing to pay attention to. It's like, it's not like we're building up calluses and thick skin. We're just learning to pay attention and make intelligent choices. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I get that question. I'm, I don't mean to go off topic, but people sometimes ask me or they see me running barefoot. Um, or they'll come to the gym like, did I just see you running barefoot up the, up in the main street the other day? I'm like, yeah, that was me. And they're like, you had no shoes on at all. You're bare. And I was like, I know I run barefoot. And they're like, your feet must be mashed to a pulp. You must have like huge calluses and blah. I'm like, the other not way at all. I'm like, yeah. You would never even know by looking at my feet. The bones yeah. and the muscles remodel on the bottom of your feet. You get used to it. You adapt. And it's not what everybody thinks. You don't have like dirty feet. You don't have like mashed up feet. It doesn't make them smell any worse. Actually, your feet are cleaner yeah. when they're bare. Yeah. yeah. It's when you're stuck in a sock in a shoe all day. That's when you, you develop bacteria and odor on your feet. And it's, that's not good for your feet. You should have your feet exposed to, the, to Mother Nature as much as possible. Agreed. So it's completely opposite of what people often think. You know, your feet aren't mashed to a pulp and all that kind of stuff. I mean, in the beginning, if you push it hard, yeah, maybe you're going to get a little bit of callusing and stuff like that. But it all goes away. It's brilliant. Well, that is the perfect, um, perfect way to come full circle to many of the things that we think are the opposite of what they really are. So, uh, so on that note, um, if people want to get in touch with you and discover more about what you've been doing or do any work with you, et cetera, how would they do that? You can find me on all social media channels, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, and YouTube under Kevin David Rail or Fasting for Fitness. That's so where Kevin you can find Rail, me. R-A-I-L. Correct. And Fasting for Fitness spelled out or with the number four? Um, spelled out, F-O-R. And I also have a website called fastingforfitness.health, which mm -hmm. is fasting, F-O-R, fitness.health. You can find me there too. Perfect. Well, I, A, I do hope people um, check out what you're doing because I love what you're up to. And, Thank you. Uh, and especially because, not because it's just counterintuitive, but because it's creative and if you really look into it, there's nothing that you're saying that is um, crazy. 
if I mean, there's really, you know, there, you can really draw a line between from the things you're describing to things that really do make sense if you start looking into it with any degree of um, curiosity and scientific mind. So, um, so much, much appreciated. So definitely check out Kevin on social media, on his website, et cetera. Let me know what you experience when you do. And for everybody else, just a reminder, um, head over to www.jointhemovementmovement.com to find out more about places you can have the enjoy the podcast where we are on social media um, where you can leave comments and reviews etc to help us spread the movement about natural movement and if you have any questions or recommendations or comments whatever you can drop me an email at move m-o-v-e at join the movement movement.com and until then uh, just go out have fun and live life feet first <laughs>